So when talking about a contest between a, a guerrilla citizenry and a tyrannical government, it's very difficult to convey to people what war is like. And I don't just mean the experience of the individual people killing and, and dying uh, in various skirmishes here and there, but the overall picture of war and the distinction between a conventional army and a guerrilla army. So one of the questions was, when you talk about the uh, 22 million veterans, aren't you now presupposing a fair level of organization for them to be a serious threat to the military force? Okay, as I said in that video, the video to which that comment is a response, when people leave the American military, that information is not sucked out of their head. It, it stays with them. And there are certain things you're going to remember. You might not know your birthday. You might not know your home phone number. You might not be able to remember when you're and your wife's anniversary is. You might not know your favorite kid's graduation day or birthday or all kinds of things. But there are certain things in life that these types of people are going to know. And the reason they're going to know it and they're not going to forget it is because their lives depended on knowing it. When you are led to believe for very appropriate reasons that if you forget this piece of information, you die, that has a way of sticking in your head. So, the uniform services aren't called the uniform services because they all wear matching outfits. They are uniform in doctrine, they are uniform in discipline, they are uniform in maneuver, uh, all kinds of things that they're uniform in. And the reason being is, um, if I have Battalion A, Battalion B, and Battalion C, Battalion A gets wiped out, I need to be able to take Battalion C and have them replace Battalion A without any loss of momentum. They have to be interchangeable. I need to be able to take a slice element from this unit and put it in that unit for it to function perfectly without having to do any training. So you have, you have a uniform doctrine that uh, pervades the, the, uh, the service. Everyone will know it. Now some of it is written into field, uh, training manuals of different types. But some of it is what I like to call a warfighting common law. For instance, I don't know Voodoo 6. I've never, I've never met him. I don't think we've ever had more than a couple of comments uh, exchanged between each other. We've never had a conversation. I've watched some of his videos. He's watched some of mine. Nevertheless, I know that if he and I are in the same place and you put in five or six other veterans, that uh, we can, in seconds, have a fully functioning hierarchy. You are a platoon sergeant. You are a squad leader. You are a team leader. You are, okay, bam, here's the organization. In seconds, we can do that. And everyone's going to know their particular role. And with respect to the uh, what I call the warfighting common law, if Voodoo Six and his friends and I are milling around somewhere and uh, something happens and we need to, in a tactical and secure kind of way, maneuver from here to there, we don't have. There's no training. There's no cooperation and an agreement that needs to be done. All all the one guy has to do is, and that's going to immediately tell everyone. You're not going to find you're not going to find that in any training manual. That's part of the warfighting common law. But all those guys are going to immediately know, one, what the guy uh, is looking at, two, what the general structure of the maneuver is going to be, and then there can be some additional things you'll have, you know, well, I, I guess can't really see it here. My video is not wide enough. Uh, the screen's not wide enough to capture it. But anyway, just a couple of hand, hand gestures, and everyone is going to know what their particular function is. They're going to know how the maneuver is going to operate, what, they're, what they need to do as they're approaching where they're, their decision point and what they need to do once they cross the particular danger area that's uh, signified by what's, if you want to look it up, it's called scrolling the road. And it's just an example. There are dozens of different things I could have done. I just happen to have chosen that. Uh, for the near side, uh, the, the near side security, far side security, they're going to know how that operates. Now, the interesting thing there is it's information. It's knowledge. So the, the same thing that allows all those soldiers, former soldiers who are now in my hypothetical guerrilla squad, to be able to do that immediately is because they know the playbook being used by the American military. They have that common language. The difficulty is anybody watching these people move who also knows the playbook knows exactly what they're going to do, who's going to go where, how long they're going to be there. Uh, and so if they have a, if they are in the mood of sniping, they can in advance target a particular place where they know that the individual person is going to go to take that person out. Why do they know where that person's going to go? Because we, because if you have two guys who are looking at the same danger area and they're going to, in this linear danger area in this particular case, and they're going to scroll the road, they're going to make very similar decisions about where they're going to go. When they're on the near side and when they're on the far side. And indeed, um, part of it is that the, the, the first guy sets where the next guy is going to be. So all you have to do is wait till the one guy that you know is going to be coming across, the leader, uh, gets to where his designated point is and you put a bullet through his head. 
the, so anyone watching our movement would know that. Similarly, if we're watching any conventional army move, and they happen to undertake this maneuver, we know what's going to be happening with them. Now, they are uh, much more constrained by doctrine than a guerrilla unit will be. Guerrilla units don't have the, the, the resources of a state. They really don't. They have to be clever. They, they can't do the brute force maneuver, uh, battle fighting strategy. They have to be very strategic. So they're already accustomed to, one, knowing the, the battle plans of the opposing group, and two, not using it because they, they, they can't afford the inefficiency that goes with it, whereas the conventional military depends on these kinds of things. So watching them, the conventional military move, and watching their hand and arm signals, because they're not, you can't remake a whole army overnight because someone's learned what this, this thing means or that thing means. You, can't, you could never control against that. You would have to expend so, much, uh, so many resources retooling the army, retooling the military every day as one person changes allegiances, and you just can't do that. That's a hindrance to a conventional fighting force, not at all for a guerrilla fighting force. They'll have a common uh, way of talking, but each little individual group is going to be its own insular group, and they're going to have their own common language they'll develop. That's much more difficult to penetrate than a conventional military, where you have to be able to interchange divisions. You have to be able to interchange brigades, that kind of thing. So, no, the, the, these veterans are a ready-made fighting force. They understand hierarchies. They understand the different echelons of operation. Um, I was, uh, when I did my little spiel on the Magic Sandwich show, and we were after, after I think it was after it was off the air, we were talking about different kinds of insurgencies. And I'd ask Thunderfoot to explain to me what, explain to me, say, city of Seattle, Chicago, pick a city, whatever, I don't care. Explain to me, in, in general terms, in broad terms, what his Maku would look like. And he couldn't answer the question. And I know why he can't answer that question. He doesn't know what a Maku is. Anyone who's been in the military and has done any strategic planning knows perfectly well what a Maku is. It's the modified combined obstacle overlay. It's an extremely important part for planning out a warfighting operation. It's where you identify problem areas. Uh, where are your people going to be in defilade? Where's a defile? All these kinds of things. Uh, I can't walk up to a civilian on the street and hand them a lensatic... Do you mind? Hand them a lensatic compass and a topographical map and expect them to get anywhere, let alone be able to identify uh, the di various kinds of relief. Um, different elevations on the map. The different line contour lines are going to indicate how rapidly the uh, elevation declines or increases. Uh, pick out the artificial structures, the man-made structures, the, the uh, natural structures. None of that. Whereas the Voodoo 6 type of person, I don't have to ask him a question. Because if we're going to be going somewhere, he and I are already going to be looking for that kind of shit. And if he and I look on the same map, he and I are going to see the same things. And he and I are going to understand uh, certain maneuvers will be appropriate, certain maneuvers will not be appropriate, certain things that a fighting force will do, certain things that it won't. There is a lot of information that soldiers study. They spend months to years practicing and studying, and you don't forget a good deal of that when you leave the military. Okay. Um, so, if you, if you, while these individuals are highly trained and capable in their specialties, they probably aren't that much of a threat to the, the military force on their own. Well, no, no one's that, that much of a threat to a military force. On their, I mean, you got a couple of guys. They're not going to take out an army. It's just not going to happen. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not presupposing here that it's going to be you know five guys with a deer with a thirty odd six <laughs> going out and conquering the country. Nothing like that's going to happen. But eat, the, the soldiers, the, the troops will have their various specialties. But there's a reason that they all attend basic training or boot camp, whatever the very service calls it. That's the common language. That's what everyone's going to understand. And you have to have a certain proficiency with that. Anywho, <clears throat> would it not be correct to say that these veterans are in fact trained to be part of a well-oiled machine that relies upon protocols, chain of command, and other structured structural elements the guerrilla veterans wouldn't have? Um, and that's guerrilla as in the apes, not guerrilla as in the irregular soldiers. Just completely different mental image when I think of guerrilla veterans. Ape veterans as opposed to guerrilla veterans. War fighting irregular soldier types. Anyway, anyway. The well-oiled machine doesn't deal with uh, the individual troop or, to a lesser degree, um, at, at the team level or the, the level of a squad. Here you're talking about uh, different platoons having different objectives but working together, uh, different companies having different objectives but uh, working on some common plan for or goal. Okay, when you talk about 
armies in the army. It can get a little confusing because the army has a couple of different uh, senses in which it's used. When you have the army, the United States Army, which is the whole kit and caboodle, and then you have an army within the army, and that'll have a four-star general who runs it. And under that, we'll have you'll have a a corps, and uh, each corps will have a, a, a couple divisions. Each division will have a couple brigades. Each brigade will have a couple battalions. Each battalion will have a few companies. Each company will have a few platoons. Each platoon will have a few squads, and each squad will have a couple or a few um, teams. So that's the general way it works out. Now, um, this is there are some exceptions to this, but in general, the four-star general level, the, the the army level doesn't do any of the tactical planning. They are okay. Uh, Division one, I'm sorry, Corps one. This is your general responsibility. Corps two. That's your general responsibility, and then so the three-star generals, the, the core level, core level generals. All right, division commanders. Here's where we're going to start the tactical planning. Uh, here's where we're going to start the strategic part. So that's where you get into like the particular war fighting units are going to be doing X Y Z task. This is where the Maku comes in handy. The Maku is just a bunch of acetate overlaying on each other, and it'll have all kinds of different units. Uh, um, well, dealing with obstacles. So you'll have supply lines approach routes where you can mass troops, where you can't mass troops, where there uh, where there's a defile. Um, I can't convey to you the amount of information that, that you could glean by looking at someone's Maku. It, it really is the nuts and bolts of their war fighting plan. You get that, and you know where everybody is and what everybody's goal is. Um, a simplified version of it, if you look back at the Gulf War, when Norman Schwarz Schwarzkopf had that map, it had a little arrows going here, you know, that, that wonderful, brilliant... Uh, that little brilliant strategy of his to fault to publish a false battle plan that Saddam followed. Hey, look at that shit! He told us. Yeah, no, no, no commander's going to do that. The last thing you want is for everyone to know exactly where all your troops are going to be doing, and more importantly, what their particular function is in the overall warfighting plan. Um, that's the well-oiled machine you're talking about. Where if you kill a platoon of people here, not a big deal. There's another platoon that can replace them. Uh, uh, well, providing that you've not been fighting a war for very long. But the way that a guerrilla unit is going to contest a conventional military is by watching, by understanding how that military works, and then bleeding it dry. And as I mentioned in the other video, the way that, that one of the things that, that is a threat to the United States is the unwise way by which we prosecute conflicts. Look at the Boston Marathon bombing and the response to that. The response was totally out of proportion to the bad thing that happened. Obviously, the bombing was a horrible, horrible thing. People were injured, people were killed. Terrible, really bad, evil act. But they locked down that entire region, closing down all of its commerce. Uh, so no one's, no one's turning a profit. There's no money changing hands. And they activate all these, these people, these state uh, employees, who are still being paid. That money's coming from somewhere. And I note that a lot of places in the United States don't exactly have... Um, well, they're in debt. That's the nuts and bolts of it most places. Uh, the citizens are locked down in their houses with, with armed troops, troop-like looking people going door to door in a very un-American kind of way. And by the way, I hasten to add, it was not a single state agent who discovered the guy they were looking for. It was a private citizen who discovered this person after the lockdown was over. Just FYI. We don't respond, we overreact in the short term and underreact in the long term. When September the 11th happened, I remember thinking that day a couple of things. The first one of which was, I hope whoever has done this enjoys it. I, I really did. I, I hope they're laughing. I, I thought, I really hope you're enjoying this moment. Because I knew what was going to happen. And that was going to be the last thing they would get to enjoy, or one of the last things they would get to enjoy. So they, it had better well been worth their while. Simultaneously, as I was talking to my friends about it, I told them this is, this is going to be an economic disaster. We are going to invest all kinds of resources fighting this, and it's going to be a huge problem. Now, you don't need to be psychic to do that. All you have to do is watch how we react to things, and you can cause the most minor, well, I can't say the most minor, September 11 wasn't minor, but in a historical perspective, it is barely a footnote. Particularly look at all the deaths that have come uh, in, in our response to that. There's 3,000 people, a very small number. Anyway, nevertheless, still horrible, but putting that off to the side. Look at how we respond to things. 
we will dramatically overreact. We don't react wisely. We, we react like a giant uh, by using brute force. We start invading countries, spending money we don't have to spend. That's why I said in the other video, that's what's going to destroy us. These people are watching how we react, and they can exploit it. Look at how quickly the Patriot Act came into being. The Oh, look, they're, they're going to sacrifice their liberties for this. They're going to invest trillions of dollars uh, to kill a few people, a few bad people. If you look at the price we pay per kill of a, of a person who we'd actually want, wanted to kill, we're spending a lot of money for one kill. A guerrilla army, or a terrorist, if you look at the, uh, the, the uh, Boston Marathon bombing, some pressure cookers, a few bucks, very uh, large consequences for the price paid, and then the price that was paid by the state and taxpayers ultimately to catch those two guys was huge. A loss of economic revenue in that region for, what, days. Uh, people's freedoms completely stripped, locked in your houses like small little animals, putting your own little selves in jail because one or two guys out there are going to go hurt some people. That's the problem that we have, and it's a problem that a conventional army has. The price you have to pay per round to kill your enemy is exceedingly high, particularly when the enemy you're fighting, well, no matter who you're fighting, but uh, the disparity here is that the, gorilla, the, the, the people fighting a guerrilla war spend very little money per kill, and they don't even have to kill anybody to make you have to do all kinds of things that increase the production cost of your whole little war fighting machine. When I mentioned um, putting the scotch tape and, and the, that one particular system on an aircraft to bring it down, there's a defense to that. It's just every time they have to take off, they have to do uh, much more labor-intensive work to examine the whole of that system. That slows down their response time and increases their cost per launch. And you do it to one or two aircraft, it's not just that region where they do it. They do it to respond to it, they have to do it everywhere. You look at September 11th, a couple of aircraft, and then that policy to, to respond to that had to be applied to every aircraft at every airport in the country. A colossal expenditure. Anyway, it, a military is a horribly inefficient thing to, to keep uh, money-wise. Nevertheless, you have... If you suggest reforming the military, even a little bit, you know, may, maybe we could, uh, they could operate off of 80% of their budget and we could start uh, being slightly smarter rather than just having a large military. Oh, you're weak on defense, so the politicians can't do it because people are going to scare the American people by saying they're weak on the military. The best line in the, the most recent pre presidential debate was when Obama said to Romney, yeah, we don't have uh, a lot of horses anymore either. There are these things called submarines and aircraft carriers, planes land on them. It's not the size of the force that matters, necessarily. It's the efficiency of it and its, its uh, ability to project, uh, a, well, whatever force it needs to project, wherever it needs to project it. And you don't get that necessarily from just having size. Anywho, and, in, and indeed, in a lot of cases, smaller is better, uh, contrary to what some women might say, or some gay guys might say. The... And I, I'm just going to leave it there. This video is already going long. So, um, leave some questions and I'll do response videos to the ones that I think are uh, interesting. Have a good day.